There's one thing that distinguishes the sword from the other five items that we've looked at. The sword is the first item that is not purely defensive. Without it, we have no way to drive the devil off. If we put on all the other items of equipment, we may perhaps be able to prevent the devil from actually wounding us, but we cannot drive him from our presence. The only thing that can do that in that list is the sword, which is called the Word of God. The Bible compares God's Word to a sword because God's Word pierces and penetrates. For instance, in Hebrews 4 verse 12, the writer says, The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The truth there is that God's word penetrates to every area of human personality. It penetrates to the marrow, the very innermost part of the physical being, and it penetrates and divides between soul and spirit, the innermost area of human personality. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. In Revelation 1.16, where John had a vision of Jesus in his glory as the Lord of the church, one of the things that he saw was a sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus. This is what he says. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. That sharp double-edged sword is the Word of God coming out of the mouth of Jesus. Since it's indicated in Scripture that Jesus himself uses the sword of the Word of God, we would do well to study just how Jesus used it in his earthly life. The clearest picture of this is found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, which describes the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness. Let me say in advance, Every time that Jesus encountered Satan personally, he used against him only one weapon, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Listen while I read this account. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Jesus did not answer the devil with theology. He didn't answer him with his religious affiliation. He didn't tell him which synagogue he attended or which rabbi had taught him. He always went straight to the scripture. It is written, it is written, it is written. And after the third thrust of that sharp double-edged sword, Satan backed off. He'd had enough. And you and I are given the privilege of using the same weapon. Return for a moment to Ephesians 6.17, where Paul speaks about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The word he uses in Greek there for word is rhema. And rhema always means primarily a spoken word. I think that's significant. The sword of the Spirit is not the Bible on the bookshelf or on the nightstand. That doesn't scare the devil. But when you take the scripture in your mouth and quote it direct, then it becomes the sword of the Spirit. 
Notice also the significance of that phrase, the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Holy Spirit. This indicates cooperation between the believer and the Holy Spirit. We have to take the sword. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that for us. But when we take the sword in faith, then the Holy Spirit gives us the power and the wisdom to use it. In my talks this week, I've dealt with the six items of protective armor. Let me just enumerate them once again. The girdle of truth, the breastplate of salvation, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If we put on and use this entire protective equipment which God has provided, we are totally protected from the head to the feet, from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet, except for one area. What's that? I told you earlier. The one area for which there's no protection is our back. And I believe this is very significant. I believe it has a twofold application. The first is never turn your back on the devil because if you do, you're giving him an opportunity to wound you in an unprotected area. In other words, never give up. Never turn around and say, I've had enough. I can't stand this. I can't take any more because that's turning your unprotected back to the devil and be sure he'll avail himself of the opportunity to wound you. But I think it means more than that because in a certain sense we're not always able to protect our own back. And I believe the implication is this. In the time of Paul, in the legions of Rome and in the armies of Greece which preceded those of Rome, it was always understood that foot soldiers would fight in close ranks. The Greek word for such a close rank was a phalanx. And they were trained to fight this way and never break rank. Every soldier knew the particular soldier that should be on his right and on his left. So that if he was being hard pressed and could not protect his own back, there was another soldier there to do it for him. I believe the same is true of us as Christians. I believe we cannot go out as isolated individuals and take on the devil's kingdom. We have to come under discipline. We have to find our place in the body, which is the army of Christ. We have to know who stands on our right and who stands on our left. We have to be able to trust our fellow soldiers. And when we're under pressure, we ought to know who will be there to protect our back when we can't protect it. In closing, let me say something which I'd rather not say but I believe it's true. You know the real tragedy of so much of our Christian experiences that the very person who protects your back sometimes wounds you. How often we as Christians are wounded in the back by our fellow Christians. That's something that never ought to happen. Let's make up our minds. We're going to stand together, protect one another's back, not wound one another. I want to move from the defensive to the offensive. I want to deal with weapons of attack, weapons that will enable us to assail and cast down Satan's strongholds. It's important that we see our obligation to take the offensive, to move out and actively attack Satan's kingdom. It's a fact of history and experience that no army ever won a war on the defensive. Somewhere in the early part of this century, someone asked a well-known French general, in a war, which army wins? The general replied, the one which advances. Now that's probably an oversimplification, but at least it's true that we'll never win a war by retreating or even by merely holding our ground. And as long as Satan keeps the church on the defensive, his kingdom will never be overthrown. Therefore, we have an absolute obligation to move out from the defensive, from mere self-protection, to attack. When Jesus first unveiled his plan for the church, he envisioned it going out on the offensive and attacking Satan's strongholds. The first time the word church is used in the New Testament is in Matthew 16 verse 18. Jesus is here speaking to Peter and he says this, 
you are Peter, a stone. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. An alternative reading is, all the gates of hell shall not be too strong for it. Uh, hell is, in Greek, the word Hades. The root meaning of the word Hades is invisible, unseen. So Hades, or hell, is the unseen world of Satan's kingdom. Now Jesus pictures his church in the light of two primary activities, building and battling. These always must go together. It's no good battling if we don't build. But on the other hand, we can't build if we don't battle. So we've got to think always in terms of building the church and battling the forces of Satan. Now many people have interpreted these words of Jesus incorrectly. They've somehow assumed that Jesus pictured the church on the defensive, being besieged in a city by Satan's forces. And they've taken his promise to mean that Satan would not be able to batter the gate of that city down before Jesus came and caught the church away. That's really a totally defensive concept of the church in the world. But it's completely incorrect. If we really analyze what Jesus meant by his words to Peter, we find that Jesus pictures the church on the offensive, attacking the gates of Satan. And his promise is that Satan's gates will not hold out against the church, that Satan will not be able to keep the church out. It's not the church trying to keep Satan out, it's Satan failing to keep the church out. Jesus promises us that if we obey him as our commander-in-chief, we'll be able to move out, storm Satan's citadels, break through his gates, release his captives, and carry away his spoil. That's the church's assignment. It's essentially offensive, not defensive. The word gate has a great deal of meaning in Scripture. First of all, the gate is the place of counsel and rule. For instance, in Proverbs 31, verse 23, it says of the husband of the ideal wife, the faithful wife, her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. Notice the city gate was the place where the ruling council of elders sat, ruled, and administered the city. So when the scripture says that the gates of Satan will not prevail against the church, it means that Satan's councils will not prevail against the church, that Satan's councils will be frustrated and brought to naught. Then again, in attacking a city, the natural place to attack is the gates. They're weaker than the walls. In Isaiah 28, 6, we have this phrase, a strength to those who repel the onslaught at the gate. So you see the picture. The picture is the church making an onslaught on the gates of Satan's citadel. And the promise of Jesus is that the gates of Satan will not be able to keep the church out. So we have to have an adjustment in our thinking. We have to stop thinking on the defensive and start thinking on the offensive. My experience is that most Christians have got the kind of attitude, I wonder where the devil's going to strike next. I suggest to you that the boot should be on the other foot. The devil should be wondering where the church is going to strike him next. I want to explain the scriptural basis for our doing so. It's really found mainly in one verse, Colossians 2.15, which describes what God accomplished through the death of Christ on the cross on our behalf. It says this, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities. Now the rulers and authorities are the same spiritual forces of Satan that are referred to in Ephesians 6.12. It's Satan's spiritual kingdom. So through the cross... God disarmed those rulers and authorities. I wonder if you've ever thought about that, that Satan has been left without armor. He's been stripped of his weapons. God, through the cross, disarmed 
the rulers and authorities. Then it says, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, that's through Jesus, or through the cross. Either translation is permissible. So God, through the cross, disarmed Satan's kingdom. He made a public display of the representatives of Satan's kingdom, and he triumphed over them in the cross. I've pointed out before that a triumph is not so much winning a victory. It's the celebration of a victory that has already been won. It goes beyond victory. It's a public demonstration that complete victory has been won. I've pointed out before that a triumph is not so much winning a victory. It's the celebration of a victory that has already been won. It goes beyond victory. It's a public demonstration that complete victory has been won. Now, Jesus on the cross did not win the victory for himself. He always had the victory. He was our representative, and he won the victory on our behalf. Thus, his victory becomes our victory. We see this in 2 Corinthians 2.14, where Paul says this, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Notice those two phrases, always, in every place. Always and in every place, we are to represent Christ's victory. God is going to demonstrate publicly the victory that Christ has won through us. That's the victory over Satan's rulers and authorities, or principalities and powers. This victory is to be worked out through us. Let's look at the final commission of Jesus given to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. If Jesus has all authority, that leaves none for anybody else except us. He yields it. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You notice the therefore. It's significant. Jesus said, All authority has already been given to me. You go, therefore. What does the therefore mean? I understand it to mean this. You go and exercise on my behalf the authority that I've already won. So our assignment is to administer the victory, demonstrate the triumph, and exercise the authority that Jesus has won on our behalf. You see, authority is only effective when it's exercised. If we don't exercise the authority of Jesus that he's given to us, it remains ineffective. Secondly, the world can only see Christ's victory when we demonstrate it. Christ has won the victory, but our assignment is to demonstrate the victory over Satan and his kingdom, which Jesus has already won. And this we can only do when we move from the defensive to the offensive. <laughs> 